Mr. Wolfowitz, um, in a sign of rising tensions in the South China Sea, China, the Chinese Navy recently cut the seismic cables of Vietnamese survey ships. Some people say in response, Australia, Japan and the United States held a small naval exercise uh, subsequent to show uh, some kind of reaction. Um, uh, Professor Hugh White in today's newspaper uh, again suggests that Australia and the United States should accommodate uh, growing Chinese power in this part of the world. Um, I won't ask you about Australia because I'm sure you won't comment, but what should America uh, and what will America do about these rising tensions in the South China Sea? I can't predict what they'll do, uh, but I, I think at least uh, in terms of what uh, the U.S. has said, particularly what Secretary Clinton has said, I think it's been the right position, which is to say the United States doesn't take sides in these issues, but we have a strong interest in seeing them resolved peacefully. Uh, and I think the notion that we should just step back and let China move in, because after all, that's, that's the future. Uh, I think there are two things wrong with it. First of all, it's not a very bright future. Uh, I think a lot of us, a lot of you, a lot of them, particularly Asians, will be hurt by it. But the second thing is, I think it really does invite bigger confrontations down the road. Obviously, you don't want unnecessary conflict and confrontation. But if you have essentially bully behavior and it is not confronted at some point, it tends to get more and more extreme. And then you come to a point where, if nothing else, politics takes over and people say, uh, enough is enough, we have to do something. I risk being accused of too many historical analogies, but you know, there was a view back in the 1930s if we would just accommodate Germany a little bit, uh, everything would be fine. And they kept accommodating Germany and finally it went too far and they gave a blank check to Poland, which most people would have said was kind of imprudent actually. I think it is very important, while everyone can agree on it, to get as many countries in this part of the world committed to the idea that yes, there are issues, there are big issues, but we've got to find ways to resolve them peacefully. And uh, if the Chinese come to believe that they can do this kind of thing and people will yield, I think you'll just see more and more of it. Yeah, uh, Dr. Wolfowitz, the two medical scientists whom you quoted making such brave statements about the Chinese uh, scientific system were both trained and worked for many years in the US. So they were people who'd had a strong personal experience of living in a meritocracy. Uh, do you have any views as to, apart from providing lots of educational opportunities for Chinese, any views as to how Western powers can foster a, a greater belief in freedom uh, domestically in China? By the way, they may be brave, but I, I'm not sure they are. I wasn't accusing them of being brave. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm, I that didn't mean that sarcastically. They may be perfectly brave, but what to me is impressive is it sounds as though with their distinguished positions, they felt comfortable saying these statements that would have obviously landed, certainly lost them their deanships 15 years ago, much less 30 years ago. So it, what struck me is the acceptance of, of that kind of comment. And I don't know enough about the background to say whether it was whether they even got in trouble for it, but I assume they were prudent men. Um, well, first of all, I think it is very important to keep the doors open in every way possible to Chinese studying in, in all the Western countries. I would include Europe. I don't think many of them actually get there, but certainly Australia and the United States. And it seems to have a big impact. And one, if you stop and think about it, it's, it's really one enormous difference between China even its worst or near worst and the former Soviet Union is, the former Soviet Union was a prison. It was almost impossible to get leave to travel unless you were absolutely clearly credentialed. Whereas, uh, I don't remember whether it was Kissinger or Senator Henry Jackson, anyway, someone spoke to Deng Xiaoping about 
the right of Chinese to emigrate at a time when the U.S. was making a big issue about the right of Soviet Jews to emigrate. And Deng's response was, how many do you want? Four million, five million, six million? <laughs> End of discussion. But more importantly, there's, they've shown, I mean, I'm sure there's some control over, I know there's control over dissidents being allowed to leave, and there must be some preference for party loyalists, but it's pretty wide open. And my experience as a dean at Johns Hopkins is when the students come to the United States, they participate completely in the political freedom in the US. When I was dean at Hopkins, there were these two charming young women. One was from Taiwan, one was from the mainland, and they were absolute best friends. Uh, I don't never gotten a political discussion between the two of them, but I think it's a, it's a wonderful influence. I think it says something good about China that they're not afraid of that influence coming back. Uh, and maybe that's part of how you dismount from the tiger. The other thing I would say, um, because uh, it's sort of a truism that we don't have big leverage over China. And when the Clinton administration in its first couple of years said, we're going to deny most favored nation status to China unless I don't remember what, what particular benchmarks for human rights progress they marked, but they, they really went out on a limb with it. And eventually they had to come crawling back because bringing China into the national trade system was something that was important to everyone. And we weren't gonna budge the Chinese on what they saw as a challenge to their political system. And by the way, it is true. Uh, it's why quiet diplomacy is sometimes better than public diplomacy. It's much harder for any regime, but particularly one with all of China's uh, self-image, to make a change based on foreign pressure, which they might make based on at least alleging their own calculations of interest. At any rate, that particular thing was a blind alley, and it leads some people to say, well, there's nothing we can do. I would say, first of all, there are individual cases that can be pursued with quiet diplomacy. There was the case of the physicist, I think it's, somebody can help me, Falun Jur, I think, who was first refuge in the U.S. Embassy after Tiananmen and eventually gotten out through quiet diplomacy. Um, but I think there are two other things. I think it is important to be pretty forthright about our values and what we believe in and not to shrink from saying them because the Chinese are going to take offense. And one reason for that is because opinion in China is not monolithic. And if it's expressed in the right way, I think explaining how our system works and why it works and with all of its messiness, which is easy to read about, nevertheless, it has some advantages. Somebody got to Zhao Ziyang, who, after all, started his career as a bloody-minded land reformer in Guangdong province. Uh, Land reformed his own father, I believe. And land reform in Guangdong in those years meant executions as well. Uh, he learned enough about the Western system to believe in it. If we don't believe in it ourselves and don't explain it, and there are ways to explain it non-confrontationally, uh, then we're not putting our weight on the right side of the scale in their internal debate. When Reagan went to China in 1984, uh, gave a speech to the National People's Congress, and I was involved in preparing, and it was basically all about explaining the American political system and what its advantages were. There was not a word of criticism of their system, except by implication. And one of the, the number two in our embassy in, in Beijing was very opposed to giving the speech, and when the speech was given, uh, it had originally been agreed that they were going to transmit it live, and they cut off the live transmission almost immediately. And our press started getting in their usual tizzy, oh, there's a, there's a controversy, they love it. And this gentleman came running up to us and said, see, I told you so, you shouldn't have had that speech. Well, I'm sorry, but the fact is that now the entire top four million cadres in China were going to find out what was in that speech that they had to censor it from the president. And I think it was a useful exercise. And one last thing, which I believe is very important, and that is Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan is a model right off the coast of the fact that Chinese people with a Chinese culture are capable of operating democratic institutions. 
When the votes were counted uh, in Ma Ying-jeou's election, which was February of 2008, I think, Chinese on the mainland stayed up all night watching their television to see the results. But they were not only seeing the results, they were seeing how a system works and that it can work. Uh, and I think to lose, to let that go, to let Taiwan be submerged in, uh, would be a big mistake. I think the future of China is much more with Taiwan than the future of Taiwan is with China. Uh, Dr. Wolfowitz, you used the term relentless in China's economic march, and there's no doubt signs of that. And yet the most relentless economic progress we've seen in the last century has been Scandinavia, Europe, post-communist Europe, Australia, America, New Zealand, etc. How relentless do you think this march in economic terms in China will be when they lack some of the absolute fundamentals that makes the relentless march in those countries I mentioned more secure? A quick checklist of an independent and fearless judiciary, a free and multi-partial, multi-party and scrutinised clean election system, electoral system, free speech, secure property and copyright rights, and laws that bind the governed as well as those that govern. I guess my short answer, first of all, I agree with the implication of your question. I think the short answer would be you can, and I don't know if I use the word relentless, I certainly didn't mean to, it's high rate of growth. I did, fine, okay, uh, I can understand why. But look, every country, including the US and others, has, have achieved high rates of growth when we're behind everybody else. China is still, 25% of the per capita income of the United States and other advanced countries. And it is inevitable, especially if nothing changes, that that growth rate is going to slow down when they can no longer just do the sort of low-end imitation. But I think institutions are going to have to change. I think, take one simple example. Uh, China aspires, I'm not sure with how much relentlessness, <laughs> to have the yuan be a generally accepted world reserve currency, maybe the world reserve currency. There is no way in God's green earth that that is going to happen unless Chinese institutions change fundamentally, unless the Chinese financial system is open in a way it's not, and exchange rates are open in a way that they're not, and the judicial framework is reliable in a way that it's not. Uh, I appreciate the, the question, and I will keep it in mind in, in other comments, because I think that that we're a little too pessimistic about ourselves because we're not growing at 9% a year. Well, at, our, at the level of your economy and ours, we shouldn't be growing at 9% a year. That's not the goal. Thank you. Dr. Wolfowitz, it's a Sue Lannan from the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. Uh, can I ask you, do you think the policies of the Bush administration, such as the war on terror and the Iraq war, backfired and made the world a more dangerous place by increasing terrorist attacks? And secondly, do you think there should be a peace deal with the Taliban and Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan? Uh, I'll give a simple answer to the first part of the question. I think it is remarkable, and I would not have taken even a small bet on September 12, 2001, that we would not be hit again uh, in the United States, or that Al-Qaeda would be in such weak shape now, or that Indonesia would be doing such a fantastic job of pursuing terrorism in Indonesia, which has affected Australia directly. I think there have been real advances, and I think uh, instead of constantly looking backwards, I think the place to be looking right now is at this political revolution that is sweeping the Arab world. Uh, at the conference up in Kulam the other day, one of the commentators said, you shouldn't talk about an Arab Spring, that is too predictive, but it is an Arab awakening. Uh, it is a hugely important event. Uh, I wish to some extent that bin Laden had gone sooner, but I'm glad that he lived long enough to see Arabs who are willing to sacrifice their lives, not for the dream of heaven and whatever number of virgins, but because they want to improve life for their own people here on Earth because they believe in freedom, because they believe in democracy. It's quite a contrast to the death cult of Al-Qaeda. So I would say we made progress, but right now we have a fantastic opportunity in front of us to try to support those people in the Arab world who truly do believe in freedom and democracy. You can be sure 
that people like uh, the existing terrorist regime in, in Iran that does not want to see freedom and democracy are doing their best to support the other side. And I think we, when I say we, I mean all the democracies of the world should be putting our weight with those people who share our values. And there are obviously a lot of them and a lot of them who are willing to take great risks in, in order to achieve them. And Sergio, sorry, the follow-up the, the follow question, what about uh, what was peace deal oh, in Afghanistan with Taliban or even Al-Qaeda? Uh, I'm not going to answer, but I'm going to explain why I'm not going to answer it. And that is the, it is a very tactical judgment, but a very important judgment in a conflict like that one, or like earlier with the counterinsurgency in Iraq. You want to split the reconcilables off from the irreconcilables, but the worst thing you can do is to bring irreconcilable people into a position of greater power. Uh, and how you decide whether somebody is genuinely reconciled or whether they're simply making a tactical accommodation in order to hit you harder in the future is a judgment that, first of all, has to be made by Afghans themselves, principally. And if Americans have a view, and they have to have a view, I've got enormous confidence in Ambassador Ryan Crocker, who is now our ambassador in Afghanistan. And if I tried to tell him what he should do, especially in a public forum, he would say, why don't you just let me do my job? I'm happy to do that. Dr. Wolfowitz, what, what effect do you think the US budget deal will have on military and policing capabilities? And what impact will that have on global and regional power dynamics? Um, it's really uh, much too early to tell. Uh, there is the potential, and it has a lot of uh, national security types on, in both parties concerned that the second part of this deal, depending on how it works out, could impact defense very severely. Uh, and they say more severely than, uh, so severely that it would have very adverse impacts. Uh, but that's, I believe, and from what I understand about the deal, that's only if they can't come to an agreement on a more balanced approach. But look, there is no question in this environment where everyone agrees, not everyone, but there is a pretty broad consensus that the US government is spending too much. Any spending is vulnerable. And even though the entire, if you eliminated the entire defense budget, you wouldn't deal with our fiscal problem, but it's pretty hard not to touch it when you're touching everything else. So uh, I think it's gonna be part of the debate going forward. And I hope also that we can, whatever we end up doing, and I'm not an enthusiast for deep defense cuts. And by the way, let me make this clear. When we had a huge stimulus bill two years ago, there was no increase for defense. In fact, we killed programs like the F-22 that had tens of thousands of jobs to go with it. To me, it was incomprehensible when we were supposedly trying to stimulate the economy that we would kill active defense programs that at least were job creators. So everything else has gone up. Defense was flat, and now everyone says, and you can't avoid it. Well, if others are coming down, defense will have to come down. But there's a strong case to be made that defense should not come down by any means proportional to the rest of discretionary spending. I have two quick questions, one here. Thanks, Craig. Thanks, Dr. Wolfowitz. Um, Martin Stewart Weeks is my name, and I work for a company called Cisco Systems. I've heard of You probably of know. And I'm particularly interested in the intersection between economic, social, and institutional development and technology, of course, hence I'm going to read my quote from my iPad just to show you that I know how to use one. But actually, because the quote I'm going to read, I've been able to check while you've been talking, and it's, a, it's relevant to the comment I want to make. It's a Reuters article about the train crash recently in China. China's media, and I'm quoting quickly, just a couple of paragraphs, are curbing combative reporting of a high-speed train disaster after what observers said were orders from the ruling Communist Party's propaganda arm, and so on and so forth. For a week, many Chinese newspapers defied censorship pressure and pursued unusually aggressive reporting of the July 23rd crash that killed 40 people. Censors have stepped up demands for news media to wind down, uh, often withering criticism over the train crash. But in a sign of, pow of the power of China's internet to challenge state controls, users of Sina.com's Weibo site, Weibo site, the nation's most popular version of Twitter, 
uh, posted messages denouncing the clampdown, and the figures I saw recently were there were at least 26 million messages on that particular Twitter stream about the China train crash. And here's a quote from one of them. Why have the people been robbed of the right to know? How long do they want to hide, said one comment. We won't accept being treated like idiots. The quick question I have is, if we are on a long march to a more open and democratic China, is this internet technology stuff going to help, or is it in fact going to drive the Communist Party to even more furious attempts to stop it happening? Well, I could ask you, why are you making such a big deal about 1% of the population? <laughs> They're obviously just dissatisfied dissidents. <laughs> no, but much more seriously, I look, uh, it's not so surprising that you had the clampdown. What, I think it's already significant and surprising that senior editors had as much discretion to get away with what they did at the beginning. Uh, and we'll see whether they aren't punished for it. That's, that, that, by the way, is the disturbing aftermath. Um, but I, look, I think the ability for ordinary citizens to communicate with one another is hugely powerful politically. And I don't have to get any fancier than the fax machine and the, I believe they were mimeograph machines that were used by Solidarity in Poland. They weren't even Xerox machines that helped to bring down the Soviet Union. I don't think it's an exaggeration. Uh, so I think the answer is yes. And frankly, I, well, I don't know what I don't know, but I have a strong feeling that the U.S. has really dropped the ball here in places like Syria. That the, or take it back two years, in Iran, it was clear that the administration, the, the, the regime was using, I believe it was actually German technology to try to, to effectively shut down communication among the protesters in Iran in the summer of 2009. And I would have thought with all of our technological skill, we could have found ways to counter that counter. And, you know, I get sometimes told, well, you, you just don't know, you're not cleared any longer, but I can read the body language, and when we're as timid as we are about even criticizing the regime publicly, I don't imagine we're being very aggressive privately. It's a huge benefit. And I, let me say one other thing, too, since you're here, uh, and if there's anyone from Google, it really doesn't matter where you're from, but I have an Egyptian friend who, he's more than middle class, he's, I guess, borderline wealthy, uh, who was out in Tahrir Square week after week, uh, absolutely exhilarated by what was happening. And we've talked some, and he said, what we really need in Egypt is kind of like a Google for democracy, where there'd be, and I don't know if that's the right analogy, I think it is, a sort of one place where you could go to learn anything you wanted to learn, especially in Arabic, about democratic institutions and how they function in different places and how you organize parties and how elections can be run. And I'm sure, you know, an enterprising person can find most of that somewhere on the internet, but it seems to me the genius of Google is you don't have to be terribly enterprising. It's, it's readily accessible. And uh, if you know anyone who, I'm actually gonna try to get to some of the Facebook crowd to see if it can be done. I think the, the ability to communicate is, is just huge, and I agree with you. Last one. Snowden from Radio Australia, Mr. Wolfowitz. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to ask a question. And it's this. Um, I, I'm interested in your comments about weighing up China as a competitor or as a threat, and you're coming out on the com competitor side and, and how economies need to um, approach China in that way. One of the most uh, profound uh, recent developments, I suppose, is the fact that China now is the largest holder of US Treasury bonds. Would you briefly, briefly give a view on that, the pros and cons, if that's possible in a brief time? Is that all positive in, in terms of um, bringing China, if you like, in one way, into the tent, if you like? Or do you see some risks in that? Thank you. Well, I think, first of all, it's just not a terrific position to be in to have so much debt outstanding anywhere. And uh, there certainly is the possibility that China can use that debt for leverage over other issues. But I think we exaggerate that somewhat because, for one thing, uh, 
China doesn't buy American debt just because they like our color of our eyes. Uh, there aren't too many other places to put it. I don't think they're busily buying euros these days either, and there's probably a limit to how much Australian debt you can buy. They're certainly finding there's a limit to how many gold mines they can buy. Uh, they're buying pretty much all the ones they can find. So if you're going to run the kind of surpluses that they run, which is because their currency is manipulated, let's face it, uh, you've got to have some place to park those reserves. And with all of our problems, U.S. Treasuries are still one of the safer places to do it. Plus, I think um, I think it was Keynes. I've quoted him twice today now, even though someone said he's dead. I don't think he's dead. Well, he is dead, but I don't think it's nice to you. He famously said, if you owe your, uh, more or less, if you owe your banker 10,000 pounds, your banker owns you. If you owe your banker a million pounds, you own your banker. Uh, this leverage works both ways. The Chinese need a successful American economy. I'm sure they're looking at what's been happening the last few weeks uh, with some distress about what it might mean for their assets. But on the other hand, I imagine they are genuinely hopeful that we will get our fiscal situation back in order. Faced with a choice between a weak America and their reserves suffering versus a stronger America and their reserves doing better, I think they will look to their pocketbook. But uh, we've got to look to our own fiscal situation. Thank you very much.